Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We'll start this webinar in just a moment. First off, I just wanted to make some announcements about our upcoming webinars. On Tuesday, June 11th, we have Human Rights Due Diligence, New Laws for Global Supply Chains with Garrett Brown and the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health. And then on Wednesday, June 26, we have Workplace Mistreatment, Evidence of Prevalence, Antecedents, Impacts, and Intervention with Dr. Albert Zhu and the California Labor Lab. And for any more information about upcoming webinars, you can visit coeh at berkeley.edu backslash about CE. So welcome everybody to today's webinar. On behalf of the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health, we're pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, What Does It Take to Prevent and Address Workplace Violence? Moderated by Alejandra Domenzane. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. The webinar will run from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Pacific time. Alejandra will be moderating the conversation today with our panelists, and we'll leave some time at the end for Q&A. All participants who logged in with their registration email for the full live presentation today will receive an email tomorrow with a link to an evaluation form that will qualify participants for a certificate of a completion worth one continuing education contact hour. You'll be muted during this presentation. If you'd like to ask a question, please enter it into the online Q&A box. We will save some time at the end of the presentation to address as many questions as possible. And this presentation will also be recorded and it will be made available on the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health YouTube page within five business days. We'll also make available the slides from today's presentation and you can just send a message to our email, coehce at berkeley.edu if you're looking for those. And with that, I'll start by introducing our moderator, Alejandra Domenzain. Alejandra is a program coordinator at the Labor Occupational Health Program at the University of California, Berkeley, where she develops projects to address the health and safety of immigrant low-wage workers in a variety of high hazard industries. She has deep expertise in training low literacy participants, building the capacity of community-based organizations, training of trainers, policy advocacy, strategic enforcement of labor laws, and qualitative research, partnership, and funding development, as well as project management. So I'll hand it over to you, Alejandra. Thank you so much, Will, and thank you everyone for being here. So for those of you that don't know LOHP, our mission is to promote safe and healthy and just workplaces. And the way we do that is to build the capacity of workers and worker organizations so that they can take action, right, to improve their working conditions. And unfortunately, you know, one of the issues that we hear about a lot from our partners who are unions and worker centers and community-based organizations is this problem of workplace violence. Um, and in fact, you know, according to OSHA, it's the second leading cause of fatal occupational injuries. So of people that are dying in the workplace, and you think of all the hazards, right, that we have in all the various industries, it's other people that are the second leading cause. Um, and so we're going to hear from a wide, three wide range of perspectives, three people who are going to tell us um, first, Megan Stanzak uh, is going to give us the worker perspective. What is it like? You know, what are we talking about when we say workplace violence? What does it look like um, from the worker perspective? And then Jassy Graywall is going to um, tell us about an amazing new law that um, UFCW, where she's the legislative director, was instrumental in advocating for that gives us new tools to prevent and address workplace violence. And she'll give us the behind the scenes of why that happened, how that happened, what tools it now makes available. And then lastly, we have uh, John Zuli, who's the director of the Anti-Violence Training Institute and an expert on violence prevention. So if we want to do this well and take it seriously, um, how do we do that? What kind of training? do we need? Um, so without further ado, I think we're going to jump in because we have really amazing speakers for you today. So I'm going to start um, talking with Megan. And Megan Stanzak, as I mentioned, she's currently the workforce coordinator for United Food and Commercial Workers Local 5. And so she has extensive experience in the industry. She worked for 16 years in a grocery store and then was a shop steward for eight years. Um, and now, you know, she's charged with really putting on trainings on health and safety for workers, making sure that health and safety is represented in union contracts and just advocating for members and for better standards in the industry. And so I want to just start with you, Megan, if you can tell us like what 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 were you seeing? You know, what were you seeing when you were a worker? What kinds of incidents are we talking about? How's it how does it really affect people um, at work? 
Um, so I'll start off with one particular instance that stands out for me that I was personally involved in. Um, so it was short on hours one week and I had to pick up an extra shift at another store. I'm sure a bunch of us in the grocery industry are used to that. Um, so I was stacking apples in the produce section where I was working that day. Um, I could clearly see the front lobby. And I watched a group of men and women walk into the store with very large bags. Um, they started walking up and down different aisles, grabbing whatever they could off of the shelves. Um, they could grab whatever they wanted off um, and throw it into their bags. Um, I could see the checker in the front lobby very clearly. And she started making announcements over the loudspeaker about security on aisle five. Um, before I could even get to her to be like, hey, don't draw attention to it. Like, just let them take whatever they need to. Um, you could hear one of the ladies... Uh, get very upset on the aisle. Unfortunately, one of the PICs who was on lunch at that point in time just walked back into the front lobby. She didn't hear what was being said over the loudspeaker or the agitation that was happening. Um, so she happened to walk up uh, right at that point in time and she <laughs> ran into one of the ladies who started yelling at her like, who's calling, who's saying I'm stealing? Who's who's saying that, you know, I'm doing this? Was it you? Was it you pointing at different people? And she ended up pointing at the PIC that had just walked up and didn't know what was going on, and then hit her in the face. Um, unfortunately, as that PIC, that person, as she was falling to the floor, she also hit the check stand with her head. Um, and I was really concerned about her. People left. Um, someone called, you know, the police. I was checking on the member. Unfortunately, in that situation, um, because it was escalated by what the person was saying in the front lobby, um, <clears throat> Uh, the the store tried to say that she was trying to block them from leaving and that was against the theft policy and um, tried to deny her her workers comp claim and actually even tried to fire her. So I actually had to step up and give a written convert uh, witness witness statement of what I had seen and you know hey it wasn't actually her she didn't do anything you know the situation just got really out of and you know nobody knew what they were doing in this moment. It needed to, um, she ended up getting the workers' comp, which was good, and she ended up saving her job. It's just really tough to sit there and be like, it takes another union member and a rep to help stand up for her in that moment because she didn't get the training. And the other person in the front lobby who was obviously agitating the situation did not get the proper training or any knowledge of what not to do in those situations. So that was really, really sad to see in that moment. Mm -hmm. That's so disturbing. And I'm sure also just in your position, you've heard about other types of incidents, right, from other workers. Is this common? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, we've had um, everything from just uncomfortable situations all the way up to violence and all the way up to death. Um, I know a lot of people have heard, um, particularly in my local, we did have one person in August of 2020 um, there was a young man who was very upset from a previous interaction that he had had from another Safeway location a few days earlier. Driving into the parking lot of the American Canyon Safeway, this man brandished a handgun and then fired multiple shots from the driver's side of the vehicle. This man shot struck um, Nathan Garza, who was a recent Rodriguez High School graduate, twice in the back while he was completing a curbside delivery at that store location. Nathan was working a summertime job at Safeway with ambitions to continue his education at Diablo Valley before he had passed. Unfortunately, these shots proved fatal for Nathan, who was only 18 when he passed, um, which was really, really sad. Um, in these moments with proper training, I'm not sure what those previous store employees at the other location could have done to de-escalate this. So this person wasn't that agitated to come back and do that in that moment. Um, so I feel like that's obviously a very heart-wrenching moment. It really impacted um, our local, which was uh, really heartbreaking. We reached out to the family and helped take care of them as best as we could. But then we have other things like in Southern California. Um, I have another statement from another worker who during her shift at a Food for Less, a member and a coworker were tasked with gathering grocery carts from outside and bringing them into the store entrance. As they were maneuvering carts towards the store, they encountered a disgruntled customer who became irate because she was blocking because they were blocking her path. Despite her attempts to apologize and explain that they were simply carrying out their duties, the customer escalated the situation by shouting at them and threatening to run them over while she accelerated the car towards them. Unable to defuse the situation, they decided to seek assistance from their store director inside the store. The customer then followed them, continuing to yell at them and make them feel very uncomfortable. Um, some of After some time, they actually had to plead with the store director to get them to be removed from the situation and to get it handled. Um, in those moments, it makes me really wonder what we could be doing better 
as training for those managers in that situation to, I'm not sure why you need to have the members plead like that to be removed from a situation that they've obviously come and seek your assistance in. Um, so I think not just in that moment, the members, but the store manager could have gotten better training on how to handle that situation. Um, I also have another incident from another person who worked in another local. Um, she says, as a grocery worker, my as a grocery worker herself and um, her other coworkers have witnessed firsthand a reduction in staffing due to self-checkout and an increase of workplace violence um, due to retail theft because of that. Um, <clears throat> she's also taxed with multitasking a lot of things like selling money grams, lottery tickets, and sometimes that takes her away from monitoring that section. Um, over Super Bowl weekend, she had observed three women who walked out of the store and not paid for their groceries. She called the police department, and then those women actually saw her calling the police, and then they re-entered the store, and then they started attacking her. She said it was very terrifying. I feared for my life. After this incident, I was scared to go back to work because I didn't know if the women would come back in again. Um, she's still very anxious when she works out at self-checkout because her back is towards the front of the door. And because of this incident, she's actually pretty terrified to report any incidents of theft in any kind of moments moving forward. So what kind of change in policy could we have had that she could have been aware of in those moments? Maybe she should have waited a little bit longer so that those people couldn't have seen her make that phone call. But to have physical violence put upon her in that moment, that's got to be really hard for her. And um, thankfully, at least her store is giving her some accommodations by not having her work in the evening and during those time frames that she's a little more worried about. So, But having some kind of policy put into place to make sure that she's taken care of in those moments would be really great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I also have another incident from Southern California and one of our other locals. Um, this was kind of worker on worker, which was kind of a little intimidating in those moments. We had an ex-boyfriend of a member who entered the store during work hours and he was looking for the member. Um, as, she's, as her ex-boyfriend entered the store, she ran to the back of the store. The supervisor and another member confronted the ex-boyfriend telling him to leave the store. As they both attempted to remove the ex-boyfriend, the member's current boyfriend entered the store and um, started fighting with the ex inside the store and in front of customers, making a very large scene. During the fight, someone yelled, he has a gun. Shortly thereafter, there was gunfire inside the store and the current boyfriend shot the ex-boyfriend and fled the store. 911 was called, paramedics arrived to treat the victim. Um, once the police uh, arrived and investigated um, a collection of statements and began, it became a very apparent that the boyfriend had been parked outside the store during the work member shift. And apparently he does this often in a stalking kind of habit. And I do understand current members tend to be a little worrisome for their partners, but it's fearful. Um, when the new boyfriend saw that the ex-boyfriend had entered the store, that's when he had made his move and went in after him. One of the workers that was really close to the fight ended up uh, taking some stress lead disability after the incident. I'm glad that they were able to get that. Um, one of the store supervisors also took leave and then apparently never came back after that because she thought it was too much for her to handle. Um, the workers that were present in the incident were given a few days off and provided a number to call just in case they needed to talk to someone about the incident. Management did follow up and call, um, follow up the incident, did not follow up with the incident with a debriefing or a meeting with the workers to address any kind of concerns. The company did not provide any specialized training or workshop to prevent any incidents like this in the future that weren't outside of their standard yearly training video that they normally do. Filing for a temporary restraining order against the man who brought the gun into the workplace and fired it would have eased a lot of the anxieties of the workers at that location. Uh, supporting the members with better follow-up, including some training, would help give them better resources to have a safer work fight, workplace. Yeah, so Megan, I feel like you're getting us into a really important topic, which is where, where's the management and all this, right? You're pointing out all these failures to prevent the incidents, you know, really mismanagement once they're happening, lack of support and even retaliation once they're over. So what do you see as a role of managers? Like how are managers handling this and what should they be doing? Um, unfortunately, managers across a bunch of the different stores have a different approach on how they handle workplace violence and how to lead members out of dangerous situations. When speaking to management and members, I get the impression that they have not been educated in how to train or to lead us out of these commonplace situations in which the potential to turn violent is very evident. 
Um, I've been told by managers in the past that it's my job to follow someone and offer them excellent customer service, um, which just kind of feels like code for go insert myself or any of my members into a very dangerous situation that we shouldn't be inserting ourselves into. Um, you never know what you're going to be doing when you're inserting yourself into a potentially dangerous situation confronted by someone who's committing some kind of a crime. You don't know if they're concealing a weapon, you don't know if they have an accomplice nearby, and you don't really know how far they're willing to go to walk out with whatever product that they are taking. Um, by contrast, um, I have had some recent store managers that understood how dangerous it is in our working environment, and they'll tell us to keep an eye out and kind of just keep ourselves and the other employees informed so that we can kind of keep ourselves away from it. I much prefer this to the prior one, um, obvious for obvious reasons. It keeps myself and my coworkers a lot safer, um, but it's unfortunate that that's not a little more widespread and common knowledge amongst the managers. I'm really reliant on that manager being a newer manager and feeling very fresh in the situations that we have been put in. So she really saw it from our position, which was nice. So we're going to be talking in a little bit about training and what's needed. And I'm just curious, since you have so much experience, you know, on the ground, like what kind of training did you get? Like, what do you see from other workers? Are they getting training on prevention and what the plan is when something like this happened? What's happening? Um, so I definitely felt like at least with the last couple of years that I have spent at Safeway, um, a lot of their training is built to be a one size fits all. You definitely get the feeling that they're not taking into job specific requirements that we have across the store. Um, often we're instructed to read something out loud, um, read something without giving adequate time to read or digest what we're taking on. I'm not really sure how members are expected to really absorb what they're uh, reading while they're multitasking in between customers or trying to uh, do other job tasks around the store if it's stocking while being read it. Um, unfortunately, we've also seen managers who try and give you a verbal summary of what the training is and then just go, here you go, you can go ahead and sign, um, which can be very problematic. Um, not to mention a lot of times this is only offered in English, which I find really disingenuous to the workforce that we have. Um, I've often, especially being a safety champion person in my store location, making sure that people got the time to really read what they were signing off on and also um, using Google Translate to make sure that they could have it in whatever language. Unfortunately, I know Google Translate is just one step um, in a direction that should be taking care of our members a lot more and making sure that they understand uh, what they're reading and signing because you have no idea what that can implement later down the line. Um, a lot of times the company will look at you and be like, well, you signed off on this. So you obviously know the policy. So now we're going to enforce it. Like calling back to that incident that I had um, with the lady, they were like, oh, well, you tried to stop her. You knew the policy. But in these moments, some of these members don't actually know what they're reading and signing off on and really have a full understanding of it. Um, unfortunately, even with some of the like newer training that they've done for our online training, um, while well, I was impressed with the new one with, you know, flashy new sequences, it definitely looked outdated compared to some of the information that I've been given. It was about active shooter. Um, it did definitely feel like it was missing the mark. It was definitely marketed for a workplace in a corporate setting with desks and doors that you could hide behind and copying machines that you might be able to duck behind which was, you know, helpful for them, but in the real world, uh, where am I going to go? Not everyone has a key to be able to lock themselves into a safe room. Not everybody knows what locations are in their stores. I know when someone was held up at our store location, half of the store didn't know that they could walk to the back, go up these stairs, and go through this room in the back, and it would drop them off into the back end of the store, not even the front end of the store, which was helpful in that situation because the person ran out the front door. But, you know, if we had a better plan, they would have known to have done that as well to get themselves out to safety. So that lack of full training would have been nice. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much, Megan. That's just a really helpful to really understand, you know, what, what it looks like for, for your members. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I want to move us um, to kind of thinking about, well, what could we do about all this, right? Like this is just so preventable and so tragic and affecting so many people's lives. And so um, I want to introduce Jassy Graywall, who's the legislative director 
with UFCW, United Food and Commercial Workers, Western States Council. And so this is the legislative and political coordinating body for nine of UFCW locals in California and also Nevada and Arizona. So in her role, she represents over 200,000 workers in the retail, grocery, pharmaceutical, cannabis, and other industries. Um, so very wide range. And um, she's just such an amazing resource. And in particular, you know, she's been at the forefront of kind of political and legislative issues at the state level. Um, and, you know, most recently with uh, AB 533, we're going to hear about um, in detail. So I guess to start with you, Jassy, like why, why was this, why was workplace violence an issue that was important for the union to address? How, how did you determine that, you know, this new legislation was necessary and that more more, more action was needed. Yeah, no, thank you so much for having us and really appreciate being able to share more about the work that we've done in this space. And especially with workplace violence being such a big issue um, for UFCW workers, um, a lot of our workers are in the retail setting and, and deal with the public and a wide variety of their roles. And um, I would say that the pandemic really heightened a lot of the workplace violence interactions that our members experienced. But this isn't something that our members weren't familiar with or hadn't dealt with before. Um, we have heard for years now um, the wide variety of workplace violence stories. And I think you heard from Megan a sampling of the stories from her local and her area. But her stories, unfortunately, aren't unique through the whole entire state. And um, I think our members are also at a certain point just come to accept that their jobs have a certain level of workplace violence or harassment that they deal with. We have some of the more horrendous stories of workers who've been shot and killed, stabbed and killed at work. But then we also have workers who on a daily basis are constantly harassed by the same customer to the point that their coworkers call an individual by a name. I've heard a story at one of our locals in Orange County where they call this man the grapefruit man because anytime he comes to the store, which is on a daily basis, he throws grapefruits at the workers. And so over the intercom, they'll say like grapefruit man is here. And I mean, it's just unfortunate. And for them, they talked about it so nonchalant, like this just happens and, and we have a nickname, but it's like, no, you are enduring workplace violence every single day. And also I would just share that like there's, we've shared examples of uh, public on worker violence, but worker on worker violence, domestic violence, um, and then also uh, uh, manager on worker violence. These are all instances that our members are familiar with, and uh, even those in um, closed door facilities that aren't accessible to the public. Um, I did just want to share a slide um, really quickly. Uh, we did a survey of our membership with LOHP when we were running our bill. Uh, just to hear from workers about what were the workplace violence situations that they experienced. And I just wanted to quickly share some of the data points that we did get from that. Um, so as you see here, 50% uh, of workers reported concern about workplace violence in their workplace. And I should just share that this survey was done with a wide variety of industries and a wide variety of our members. We represent numerous industries from healthcare to uh, grocery to drug retail to cannabis. And so this is a wide sampling of those workplaces. Um, over 70% of our workers uh, experienced fear for their personal safety at the work pay workplace. Um, verbal altercations were the most highly reported type of workplace violence um, with over 75% of workers saying they have direct experience or over 75% of workers saying that they've witnessed um, workers being verbally uh, uh, in verbal altercations. Um, over 32% of our workers have experienced physical violence at the workplace, um, and 40% of our workers report witnessing physical vi violence at work. Um, and those that experienced uh, or witnessed violence in the workplace, over 75% reported, reported mental and emotional impact um, from the workplace violence that they endured. So I just wanted to share some of that just to give a context. And uh, that survey is outdated at this point. I think if you were to resurvey members, um, they would say that this is a constant and reoccurring thing that they experience. Um, and just wanna go to Megan's point that she shared that every store, even within the same company, and then every company themselves, like no one had a standardized approach. And for us to pursue something like a general industry standard was important because we wanted to make sure that there was a baseline or a floor of protections that all workers have so that there's a standardized level of rights, uh, training, reporting that happens across a wide variety of industries. So that was really why um, UFCW wanted to engage on this issue. And why did you decide to go the route of advancing legislation, right? Because in theory, we have Calosha, they have standards, and that's supposed to take care of things like this. So why did, why did you feel that that was necessary? 
Yeah, this is a great question. We get this asked a lot. The um, the fact that we did SB 553, the General Industry Workplace Violence Standard, in legislation, this is the first time a standard actually has been adopted by legislation, which is a lot of the pushback that we received, that we should allow Cal OSHA to do this and have them go through their regulatory process. Um, I just wanted to give a bit of the background and history of why we winded up going legislation versus going the Cal OSHA route. Um, in 2014, then State Senator uh, Padilla uh, passed a bill that required Cal OSHA to promulgate a standard for the healthcare industry. And so they put together a standard in 2016 and passed that standard in 2017. And shortly after the passage of that standard, Cal OSHA worked on a general industry standard for all other workplaces not covered by the healthcare industry standard. And from 2017, us and several other labor unions had engaged and worker advocate groups have engaged with Cal OSHA in that process. And um, come the year 2023, uh, we know Cal OSHA, Cal OSHA has a lot of challenges in terms of short staffing, um, resources. And so we know sometimes and then with the pandemic that certain standards get put on the back burner. And that's what we kept seeing happen was that there were revisions, the standard get putting, put on the back burner. And even at the start of 2023, if Cal OSHA had pursued, um, had gone with a standard that they started in the regulatory process, we would have still been about two years out from even getting anything adopted. And for our members, it was such a big issue. Like for workers, workplace violence is the difference between life or death for a lot of our members. And we could not wait two to three years for Cal OSHA to finally adopt a standard. So we decided to go the legislative route because we can get more um, timely uh, uh, standards passed that way or timely laws that employers have to comply with. Um, but we did get a lot of pushback because that is not something that is typically done. And I think um, those in opposition were concerned, are we now setting a, a, a standard that everyone can now go to, Cal to go to the legislature? But for something like this, and I think the legislature agreed that we do need to address this issue because workers need to be protected. Yeah. So, so what was it like? like? I imagine it was there were some challenges involved in pushing this legislation. Yeah, it was uh, very difficult. I think how we started the bill was we modeled the general industry standard off of the healthcare standard. We see the healthcare standard. There's areas for improvements in all standards, but really the model standard when it comes to workplace violence. And what we were really concerned about was some of the drafts that Cal OSHA had put out on general industry was that it was a lot weaker than the healthcare standard. And so when we originally started um, our advocacy on SB 553, we adopted the healthcare standard and applied it broadly to general industry work sites. Um, as you can imagine, employers did not like that. Um, we had, I, I'm not even exaggerating when I say this, every single employer association in the state of California was opposed to the bill. And that's because this bill applied to all work sites, regardless of employee size at the time. And so we wanted to make sure that we had a strong coalition um, of folks pushing back on the narrative that one, that this should be done through Cal OSHA, this isn't actually a problem, and that not all workplaces deal with workplace violence. Well, workplace violence doesn't discriminate based on your workplace. It can happen at any time, and we all need to be prepared for when those incidents can happen. And so um, we had very fierce lobbying um, against us, uh, but I think the thing that really pushed our stories forward and our narrative forward were the workers who were courageous enough to share the things that had happened to them and shared their stories. And it wasn't just our members, it was other workers sharing all the violent interactions that they had to deal with are public transit workers where there's a lot of violent incidents that we've talked about. At the time, there was a recent shooting of the San Jose, um, I believe it was the MTA. Um, we had the shooting at Half Moon Bay on the agricultural side of farm workers. And so I think there was this heightened um, feeling that we do need to do something. And so we were able to push through some of that narrative. I think the place that was really challenging is that we had some um, employer groups who were um, spreading misinformation about what the bill did and did not do. And so uh, we had a had to really engage on the narrative to push back. And, and on the misinformation that was out there, we had right-wing media groups really hook on to that and say like, look what California is doing, it's so horrendous. But at the same time, if you looked at the bill, it's like, no, we're protecting workers on workplace violence. Um, so much so that there were some groups that came to the Capitol and actually threatened Capitol staff, members of the legislature, um, advocates like myself with workplace violence. We all received death threats during this process from these right wing folks. And so I think it was for us, it was ironic that we're pushing a bill around workplace violence prevention. But here we are as advocates and the legislature and staff 
who are experiencing workplace violence themselves. So it was a very difficult process, but I think for us, the worker stories and the narrative and the need to address this issue was so strong that we were able to have the governor's office engage with us and be able to, to reach an agreement in terms of amendments, which is what we see in our final form of SB 553. So it just makes it all the more incredible that this has now passed, right? It it's takes place it's implementation on July 1st, and it's for all industry. And so just walk us through it. Like what's in this law? You know, why does it matter? Yeah. So I'm going to also just because uh, this bill is really meaty. There's a lot in there. Um, so I'm going to do a quick slideshow uh, just to walk through some of the provisions. And I will keep this pretty brief. I'm happy to share our slide deck. We also have one of our labor cited attorney firms who put down we put together a more detailed slide deck that we're happy to share with participants, as well as a handout that we have that summarizes SB 553. Um, so I'm going to do a really quick overview, but just wanted to share that we're happy to share more resources um, so folks have those. Um, just really quickly going to share my screen. Um, so there were two main components of SB 553. The first one we don't talk a lot about, but I just want to flag for folks that um, under current law, employers were able to seek a workplace violence restraining order for their employees, but we had incidents where we wanted employers to do a workplace violence restraining order, but the employer did not agree to do that. And so we wanted to change this provision to allow unions to have standing to seek workplace violence restraining orders to make sure that our workers were protected, protected at the job site. So um, I don't go too much into this on the on this call or on this webinar, but um, just flagging that that law will go into effect starting January 1st of 2025. Um, but the main part of the bill is that, um, that the employers are required to formulate and maintain a workplace violence prevention plan as part of their injury illness prevention plan. Um, and as you can see, there are a lot of things that, the, uh, that employers are now gonna have to do. Um, it requires a, the employers to establish, implement and maintain an effective workplace violence prevention plan. It requires employers to record information and log violent incidents. Um, related to every workplace violence incident. This part is so important to UFCW because leading up to this bill's passage, we had so many anecdotal stories, but not a lot of like actual data around workplace violence incidents. And that's because some of our work sites like drug retail work sites, such as Rite Aid, CVS and Walgreens are federally exempted from keeping OSHA 300 and 301 logs, which require time away from work uh, due to an injury or if someone is hospitalized, um, due to an injury at work. And so we weren't getting a lot of information from some of the work sites where there were exemptions from reporting. So this is so important for us because now we're actually going to get that data of what is happening inside the stores related to, to violent incidents. Um, it also requires employers to provide effective training uh, to employees on the workplace violence plan and the incidents logs. And um, John is going to go into more detail on what is an effective training. So I'll leave that part for him to do. And then it also requires employers to keep records. Um, the one thing I do want to flag, and I know we'll talk about next steps, is that um, Cal OSHA does still have to come up with a, a general industry regulation. So under the bill, they're required to propose that standard by the end of 2025 and adopt a standard by the end of 2026. This is just more of a process portion. Um, it does not, the law still goes into effect July 1st, but at some point, it will be uh, removed from statute, put into regulations where it, it really does belong. Um, and then just flag it the, again, the January 1st, 2025 for the workplace violence restraining orders. Um, so within the workplace violence plan, I um, don't wanna go too much into specifics, but just wanna flag that um, it does require the active involvement of employees and authorized representatives. So for us, we're really excited about this portion because it allows our workers to have a voice in what should be included in the plan. We strongly believe that workers know their work sites the best and should be consulted when it comes to identifying hazards and corrective measures for those hazards. So we're really excited to see that workers will be involved in the uh, development of those plans. And that the plan needs to re be reviewed annually so that we can identify deficiencies, incidents, and then be able to amend the plan to correct that. Um, the second portion of the bill, is, as I mentioned, is a violent incident log. Um, workers and authorized representatives do have a right to request records of violent incidents. 
And so um, that is something that we are going to look forward to collecting. Um, from our perspective, the more that we know about incidents that are happening, where they're happening, what caused them, the better we can be about uh, mitigating the risk around workplace violence in those work sites. And so knowing that, is there a lot of incidents happening in self-checkout? Or is there a lot of incidents happening in the alcohol aisle? Um, and was that due to low staffing levels? Was that due to the fact that employers have policies that require workers to confront um, uh, uh, customers with what we call customer delight policies? Um, the third portion of this bill is around providing effective training. I think the one thing that we are really excited about in this version is that this bill actually requires annual training. And a lot of the previous versions of the regulation, it required training as needed. Um, but this one does actually require annual training. And we think annual training is so important for workers to be refreshed on incidents that are happening or be updated on um, additional risks that they might face in the work site. Um, we also uh, included a provision we wish could have gone farther, but that there needs to be an opportunity for interactive questions and um, someone who's knowledgeable about the plan to answer those questions within a, a quick time period so that workers weren't just taking modules and not being able to absorb it, but that they had questions they could go to someone to, to ask those. Um, and then record keeping uh, so that we can get those records if we need them. Um, and then lastly, I had mentioned that Cal OSHA still needs to uh, promulgate a standard. So that's what we have in terms of like a quick summary of what the standard includes. That's so helpful, Jassy. Thank you. And I already see actually in the Q&A section, there's a lot of questions about how this applies, how it's going to be implemented. So we'll make sure to leave some time so that we can we can get to those details. Um, but I want to move on to training because I feel like we heard really vividly from Megan how not to do training on this topic. Um, and so we have an expert here that can tell us kind of best practices. Uh, John Zuli, as I mentioned, is a director of the Anti-Violence Training Institute and just an expert on violence prevention. He's an internationally known speaker, author, and seminar leader. He's worked with um, companies such as uh, Notre Dame University, SpaceX, and he's a former California Park Ranger and field training officer and state of California certified defensive tactics instructor. Um, so John, tell us if, if um, you know, workers are going to be pushing for meaningful training that actually makes a difference, what should be involved in that training? What, what is important to have in an effective training? Well, hello, everyone. Training uh, needs to be multifaceted. Workers, uh, you know, listening to both Megan and, and Jazzy, workers need to know that workplace violence isn't just customer on employee. Uh, there can be coworker violence. So it's important for them to realize that domestic violence can find its way into the workplace. Even if you have a closed campus, you don't have the public coming in and out. And, uh, you know, last but not least, there's always, always criminal intent. So to break this down for individuals to see, you know, what are we really having to deal with? Uh, I think it's important for them to know that there, you know, violence, one size doesn't fit all, uh, let alone most. And what, what are we really up against? Every training needs to really focus in on prevention. You know, the, the, the horrors that we had in, in Texas at the Univaldi shooting, uh, so much that could have been prevented if they had a closed campus meeting. People were making a, a, at a point to lock the doors and making sure that People had to get buzzed into the office, et cetera. They actually saw the shooter coming. He wrecked his car prior to coming into the school. Uh, they saw him coming with the gun, but unfortunately, because they had an open campus, there was no way to stop him. So it's important to realize that a combination of vigilance and technology can go a long way in prevention. And, and your training program, training programs really need to emphasize that prevention is everybody's job. At, on the work site, everyone needs to be in that preventative mode because one mistake can obviously open the door to a lot of other uh, tragedies. The next is de-escalation. The idea that I can take a situation and I can actually calm things down. I, I have tools. There are ways to say things. There's ways to deal with violent situations that will at least not escalate them, if nothing else, will bring them down into uh, you know something that's manageable. And last but not least is the sense of recovery that people need from these incidents. You know, Megan was talking about people that they go, they're scared to go back to work. And, they, and when they do go back to work, they begin to have that PSD TD uh, response of, you know, the anxiety that comes out of it, the depression that follows. So just to 
encapsulate it all. People need to know the types of, of violence that they're facing. They need to know what they can do to prevent it and that it's everybody's responsibility. Uh, one of the things in the bill uh, that I noticed was is that people can be evaluated on how well they, they keep the workplace safe. They need to know de-escalation skills. There's tools out there. You're not helpless when you're faced with these situations. And last but not least, they again, how do I get back? What kind of employee assistance programs do we have? How can I recover through critical incident debriefing, et cetera? I do think also that training needs to incorporate active shooter. Uh, more than 80% of businesses out there are not prepared for an active shooter event. And while this year we do notice there's been a 30% drop in uh, active shooter incidents, you know, we don't know that we don't know where they're going to happen next and they easily could be in your area. So those are the, those are some of the basic core concepts that need to go into a training. Thank you, John. And, and one thing that I think is really great about this um, law is that it explicitly calls for worker involvement in coming up with this plan. So like, why, why does that matter? You know, Alejandra, I'll, I'll never understand leadership that doesn't take into account the employee's perspective on solving problems. If you're a real leader, you bring people into the fold, you bring them in to, to solicit what their input is. Uh, so when we have a, uh, a law that explicitly says these folks are going to be involved in the development and implementation of a plan, the benefits are, are to everybody. First off, there's no ambiguity here. We understand what we need to do. When this comes, when these situations happen, this is our game plan. This is how we go about it. Uh, you know, it's, as Megan was saying earlier, the left hand, the right hand, no one knows exactly what they're doing. So uh, it's important that we all get on the same page and, you know, I get, I get input from those individuals. I think that, uh, you know, the old adage of uh, many hands make light work or two heads are better than one. You know, we get people that really do understand the job and I'm your manager and I'm asking you to do something. I think it's absolutely ludicrous that I'm going to have somebody who is untrained to deal with uh, violence, uh, untrained to deal with de-escalation skills, go up to someone who's suspicious and have a, and, and engage them in a customer service, have a nice day, a conversation. I think that there's a, you know, there's a lot of concern uh, from that standpoint that you know, you're putting somebody in harm's way. So what is our plan? How will we manage it? How will we deal with it? Uh, you know, again, what's realistic in these situations and, you know, coming up with policies that that actually work. The last but not least, the, the good news here is, is that when we're all sitting down and talking about these things, it's going to build a level of trust between the employer and the manager. And, you know, that's, you know, when I understand what's expected of me, I can fulfill those expectations. But if we don't sit down and have it, if you come to me and tell me this is what you're going to do, perhaps that's not really the best way to work it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we heard from Jesse, you know, what is the importance also of having a log of really recording these incidents for, you know, making policy and getting an idea of bigger picture trends. But do you also see any any use of this kind of documentation just at the workplace level? Like, why is it important to keep this log? Well, I, you know, again, I think that part of the law is, is that you have to evaluate your threats. And I think that, you know, we need to take a look at what are our policies? What histories do we have? How is, and again, this is something that Megan touched on a little bit ago, how is our staffing policy affecting, uh, you know, the, the outcomes, right? How is our staffing policy affecting that? What are we doing that's actually inviting criminal intent into the workplace? Uh, so, you know, having a log like this is, is tremendously valuable from the standpoint that, we have a roadmap for prevention. We have a roadmap for how we're going to deal with things and what potential threats might be out there. Last but not least, I think that there's a tendency for us to uh, come to the party and say, hey, uh, you know, whatever happened after that incident, you know, again, going back to what Megan was saying, we had an incident. No one ever talked about it. Nothing came out of that. So when we have this incident log, employees will have the opportunity to go back and say, this is what was done to correct the problem. And if it's not, you know, again, it needs to be, you know, documented. This is what was done to correct the problem. And again, I think that that builds trust, it builds coordination of effort, and it puts us on the right track to making sure that uh, these, again, whatever problems don't come up again, or we know how to deal with them if they do. Yeah, thank you. So I'm I'm imagining, you know, you have this amazing experience with training and what's effective training. And I'm imagining in your experience, 
it doesn't always go smoothly um, in the implementation phase. So what are some, and I'm seeing in the in the question and answer already, some people kind of bringing up those issues, like what are some obstacles to actually implementing effective training that you've seen? Well, there, this is going to be a, a, a process like anything else. And this is a brand new law. We really don't know what the levels of liability will be for management. Uh, you know, again, if I allow something, is this going to be like, like a harassment issue, sexual harassment, where if I knew or should have known that something was happening that was inviting uh, uh, violence into the workplace, you know, can I, as a manager, be held uh, personally liable? So there's there's a lot of gray areas yet to be worked out. Uh, one of the problems that's one of the issues is going to be okay. Well, I've got it's twenty employees uh, or more, and you'll have to implement the training. So I have nineteen employees that showed up that day, but. Mr. 20 isn't going to be able to make it in. So what are we going to, how are we going to get that person trained? We can't just have a whole new training for that individual. I think eventually that you're going to see the training become an online model. Um, I believe that OSHA will take over the training eventually, uh, but I think it will be an online model at some point in time because of the new hire situations. But that it, that brings about a, a, a host of different issues. One is your training needs to be job specific. So the people in the front of the store or the back of the store or the front of the business, the back of the business may have very, very different responses to the same threat. How do they get out of the building? How do they deal with an unruly customer, et cetera? So I think it's important to take a good look at um, if we're going to do this interactive training, some component needs to be put in there that addresses the individual's job, the individual's job site, because every job site is going to be just a little bit different. So it's going to be challenging from that aspect. The second is, is that, you know, things like de-escalation, these are skill sets. These aren't something that you just take the course one time, you know exactly what to do from that moment forward. Because I promise you, whatever you train for, there's going to be all these, you know, different components coming at you. So how much time can we devote to the training? We all know that there's going to be this push and pull coming from uh, organizations versus the employees. Employees like longer training, organizations like shorter training. So again, that's going to be one of the challenges. How much time can we devote? I, I don't know how anyone could do the training in less than 90 minutes myself. And that doesn't necessarily include what managers need to learn about their specific responsibilities. So it's, it's the other issue that's going to come up is the fact that this is annual training. And I actually don't think this is a challenge. I think this is a great opportunity because again, as I said, you know, de-escalation is, is, uh, is a skill set. So when we have the opportunity to really investigate our, um, you know, what, what, what was my knowledge level? How well did that work last time? In other words, it allowed, it allowed people to enhance their capabilities. Also new threats are going to come up. So, or we're going to have different ways of dealing with old threats. So I think that that's, that's there's an opportunity, and I'm glad that this is um, is is specifically an annual event that people have to take a look at. So I think at the bottom line is is that it's we have to look at two things: the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. The letter of the law we need to comply with. The spirit of the law is here to keep people safe, so that at the end of the shift you're going home to your family. You know, I was a peace officer, and when they give you that badge, they there's a little saying that almost everybody, when they pin it on you, they say, wear it in good health. In other words, we want you to go home at the end of your shift intact. And every employer should have those same uh, feelings towards their employees. Hey, we want to keep you safe. And now, because of SB 553, they have a responsibility to do it. Thank you so much, John. And actually, since you're here, I'm going to start with you because we have so many questions. Um, so it's a couple of people are asking about live drills, you know, what your recommendation, how often. And there's also a question from people about, do you include not just your workers, but say, if you have a lot of volunteers that are part of your organization, who should be included in these trainings? Okay. Um, the first part again was... About live drills. Like, do you do okay. recommend conducting okay. live drills? How often? Who's included? <laughs> okay. No, no, two things. The first is, is that yes. I mean, it's one thing to say, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go this way. It, it, it's another thing entirely to do it. How long is it really going to take us to get out of the building? And this is why, you know, fire drills have been uh, done for ages. I can't tell you how many times I've been giving a seminar and all of a sudden they have a fire drill in the middle of it. 
So anyway, the, the, I think that you know, doing things live, including not just getting up and learning how to get out of, out of the building quickly, but to have role play where you be the the perpetrator and I and I have to use de-escalation skills. So I think that that's ex extremely important. And the second part is the law does require that people coordinate, right? So your volunteers need to be brought into this training. If there's businesses that are adjacent to you, if you have security personnel on staff, everybody should know what the game plan is so that no one's taken by surprise. Because again, you know, in the movies, you know, you see the shark fin and you listen to the music and you know something bad's about to happen. In real life, it's usually when you hear the gunshots. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much, John. I'm going to add, there's a few more questions that I think Jassy might be a, a good resource to answer. And so we have some questions about like what basically what counts, right? So like do animal attacks count? What about verbal, um, verbal assaults, et cetera? Sorry, was on mute. Um, so yes, verbal or sorry, uh, animal attacks do count. And if you look at the law itself, um, and I popped into one of the questions, the labor code, it specifically talks about how you log the different incidents and gives a cat like um, a wide variety of categories that you can utilize. And one of them is animal attacks. And that was also reflective of what's required in the healthcare standards. So we wanted to make sure the logs we're as close to the healthcare standard as that we could keep them. So animal attacks are included in there. Um, and then when it comes to verbal violence, um, and this is a problem with any law, is that I think some things can be construed as, is this verbal violence or not? And a lot of it's dealing with um, how the other individual feels by the verbal violence. There is a part of the definition of workplace violence that says that if you feel threatened for your safety or you feel like you could be threatened, then it does count, but something, an example that the employer community used when it came to verbal violence was, if someone just cuss, says a cuss word at you, is that considered verbal workplace violence? And it comes down to, well, was there more to it? Was someone lunging their body and repeatedly doing something and had there been a series of incidents beforehand? And did you feel like your personal safety was being, like you could have been physically attacked or your safety could have been jeopardized? But if someone just says it once offhanded and walks away and they weren't displaying any other types of body language that you could have been harmed, then maybe that doesn't count. So I think there is a bit of a gray zone when it comes to the verbal side, but going back to the definitions within the bill around what is workplace violence and ultimately what type of harm does the worker feel like could come out of this, um, uh, there's more to it than just like, yeah, how do you capture that verbal violence or the verbal harassment that workers feel? And then Alejandra, I did see a couple questions and I forgot to include this in my summary. Uh, while we did want this to apply to every single work site in California, we did have to take an amendment that said that there are a couple exemptions. And um, one of the exemptions is if you have less than 10 workers at a work site and you are not open to the public, you do not have to follow this law, but you do still have to address workplace violence in the injury illness prevention plan. So I did just want to flag that that did come across in a couple of the questions that there is an exemption, but as Cal OSHA looks to adopt a regulation, um, we are looking at ways to strengthen this law, including how do we get rid of some of these exemptions through that regulatory process. So we get another bite at the apple in terms of a, a better standard um, through that regulatory process with Cal OSHA. And since we're on the subject of how to, you know, uh, improve the impact of these kinds of laws, there was someone that was wondering about other states and if you know, you know, what, what they're doing about workplace violence and also someone asked about at the federal level, how that's looking. Yeah, so I'm not too familiar with what other states are doing. I know California was the first state to do a general industry standard and we have gotten meeting requests from other states to talk about what can some of the um, other states do or what did the process look like? How did we go about it? So we've been meeting with other states to inform their process. Um, at the federal level, I'm not aware anything is being done other than um, the federal government looking at how they can adopt uh, the healthcare standard for workplace violence. So I think they're starting with the healthcare standard and taking that into consideration. And then um, hopefully eventually moving to the general industry workplace violence standard. Uh, but as of now, California is the only state that has a general industry workplace violence uh, standard. Hmm. Here, there's another really interesting question. Someone's asking about, uh, you know, some of these measures maybe that might get in, implemented to prevent violence. How can we kind of 
make sure they don't go overboard is how I'm interpreting it. So, you know, protection from, let's say, like a campus or, you know, a, a city police department. And we know that, you know, some groups are more susceptible, right, or more at, vulnerable to being um, the, the subject of police violence. Or let's say surveillance, let's say you're installing like security cameras and there's like worker surveillance. So how do we protect ourselves from our own protections? And, you know, anyone that wants to, to comment on that, feel free. I think that, you know, whenever we're looking at protections, it, it has to be reasonable. You know, it, just like, again, the most, I, I'm comparing this a lot to the harassment aspects. Yeah, there's going to be people that are going to say, or they're going to be um, rude, they're boorish. They're not necessarily threatening, or it isn't necessarily violence. So again, that has to be reasonable. And the same thing, I think, when we talk about um, invasion of privacy or, you know, uh, the, being duplicitous and using the information that you're gathering from a protection standpoint to use it against the employee. So I think that re that we need to take a reasonable approach to what it is that we're doing. And uh, I believe that, you know, the, the union will have a say in, you know, what's, what's acceptable and what isn't. I mean, as far as, you know, if you're a delivery driver, we'd want you to have a camera in the car. I think that that would be something that would be very valuable to have some type of a recording device in the delivery vehicle but that may not sit well with the employee. So there's going to have to be some kind of balancing act. But again, it's what's reasonable that that's going to be, be uh, the standard. Yeah, thank you, John. So John, another question maybe for you. Um, there's a question about that, you know, when trainings are very realistic, maybe they involve real life scenarios and, you know, that can also be maybe disturbing or upsetting. So how do you balance that, right? Trying to be really <laughs> honest with what what's possible, but also not, um, you know, not freak people out in a way that now you're, <laughs> that becomes a, a negative thing. You know, it's very interesting. I just did a training in, in Oakland uh, last week and this came up that someone was a bit uh, taken aback by everything. You know, I, I think that uh, the key to your training needs to be, we're not here to scare anybody. People are plenty scared. What we're here to do is empower people. And the message needs to come across that you're not helpless. There are things that you can do. There are ways that you can that you can prevent violence. Uh, you know, even just coming from your car to, uh, to the workplace itself. So, you know, again, we really want to emphasize this is about empowerment. It's not about fear. I think we can squeeze in uh, one last question. So there's actually a couple of questions that are interesting about a liability. And so, for example, let's say the employer, you know, conducts de-escalation training, and then, you know, like Megan was saying, the worker gets sent <laughs> to go de-escalate, and then it doesn't turn out well. Let's say that the employee is harmed, um, or let's say, you know, there's this provision that employers can uh, seek a restraining order, right? Let, like, for example, in the case that Megan you were describing, there's a, a domestic violence incident that is now impacting someone in the workplace, and let's say that they don't um could then they be liable right that they knew that this was a, a hazard and yet they they did nothing to prevent it so do you guys have thoughts on that and on, on liability i had a conversation um with the uh, uscw's uh legal analysts uh, le uh, attorneys and i asked that very same question you know the known or should have known and the answer was uh that there really isn't any case study there's no case law that's been that's on the books so we don't know, but I will tell you this, I, I know something about attorneys and somebody is going to want to get, be the first to put their name on a case law. So, um, you know, I would, I would take the, the, the stance that, Hey, look, I might be held liable for this, but again, no one knows it's, it's never been, um, it's never gone to court. Yeah, well, I'm I'm seeing um, Will come and probably remind us that we need to start winding down. Um, so thank you. I just want to thank all of you, Jassy, Megan, and John, for just such rich experience and um, just so insightful. I feel like there's so much that we can do, and it's kind of a hopeful time that we have new tools. And yet, as you're pointing out, there's still a lot to be done in the implementation phase. Um, and thank you, everyone else, for for joining. Sorry that we couldn't get to all the questions, but um, I know that we are, we will be providing a recording of the training. Someone asked about, we will be sharing the slides. And if there's other resources, I know, um, Jassy, you've shared like a fact sheet that summarizes the law. We'd be happy to share uh, that as well. If John has any links to resources he'd like to share, we'll make sure that that gets to participants. So thank you again. And thanks to OH for hosting us. 
Yes, thank you, Alejandra. And I just want to reiterate, thank you so much, everybody. That was a really fascinating and exciting discussion. And if there are any requests for slides, feel free to email coehce at berkeley.edu. And any more information about future events, you can visit us at coeh at berkeley.edu backslash about CE. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.